in black and white, isn't it? <laughs> it's amazing what a difference colour can make. Yes, whether it's artificial colours like these, or whether it's natural colours, they all brighten things up a bit. Some colours look quite appetising. But would you want to eat this? We pick up a lot of information from colour as well. It can warn us or control traffic, or help safety by, by making it stand out in a crowd. The colours we wear and the colours all around us can sometimes even affect our mood. This studio is quite bright, lots of splashes of yellow, plenty of other colours as well. But you wouldn't be able to see any colours at all without light. We see most things by white light, mainly sunlight. It's actually more the colours of the rainbow. But because of the way our eyes work, we can make white light using just three colours. Red. Green. Blue. These are the three primary colours of light. And by mixing them together in different amounts, you can get any colour you like. Now, if you mix together equal amounts of two of them, you get what's called the secondary colours. For instance, here where you mix the green and the blue, you get this turquoise colour. That's called cyan. Here, where the blue and the red are mixed, we get magenta. And perhaps most surprisingly of all, here, where we mix the red and the green, we get yellow. Now, if you mix together equal amounts of all three lights, red, green and blue, we're back to white light again. What use is all that, you may ask? Well, it's basically how colour television works. And here to explain is the BBC engineer, Rod Fairweather. Hello, Rod. Hello, Terry. Right, where shall we start? Well, let's start with one of the cameras. Now, the light goes in through the front into the lens, and then on the inside, we have three camera tubes. Now, they look like this, and it sits just behind here. Now, the one on this side picks up the blue light. There's one down the back here which picks up the red light. Around the other side, there's one which picks up the green light. So the colour goes in through the front and somehow gets split into three different pictures. How do you do that? Well, just behind the lens here is a dichroic block. Now, that's a special type of prism which splits light just into its red, green and blue parts. But as it's right in the middle of the camera, you can't see it. So over here, we've taken one out to have a look at. Right, and here's the dichroic block, and it does look a bit like a prism. How does it work? Well, here we have an ordinary white light source, OK? Now, watch what happens. I've put the block in front of that. Ah, magic. Blue, green and red. You've split the light up into the three primary colours of light, haven't you? And presumably that's what happens with real pictures. Yes. So why don't we try pointing it at Jarton and see if it works? OK. Well, if you look through the block now, you should be able to see the red, green and blue pictures of him. Right. Now, this one should be green. And there's a blue one. And round this side is the red Jarton. So now you've got three separate pictures. What happens to them? Well, they're sent along three separate cables to the camera control room. So shall we go along and see what happens there if Jarton stays here in front of the cameras? <laughs> Suits me. <coughs> right, well, here we have the controls for the cameras. And it's actually these knobs which change the amount of each of the three colours in the picture. Well, can we have a look at the three colour pictures separately then? Sure. If we look at Jarton, there's the blue picture. There's the red one, and there's the green. Now, of course, for a full picture, we do need all three. So if we go back to the blue, add the red. Not much difference there, really. And finally, mix in the last one, the green. Goodness me, what difference the green makes. Yes, well, then, of course, you've got the problem, I suppose, of getting the exact amount of each different colour to make the picture look normal, haven't you? That's right, and it's not just for the one camera. We've got four cameras in the studio, and Jarton must look the same on each of them. Now, this camera looks reasonably good. That one's good as well. That's the one we were playing with a minute ago, so it's slightly off. But that one is well off. You don't look very well, Jarton. 
Now that's not the only problem we have. It's very important that all three pictures, the red, the green and the blue ones, sit exactly on top of each other. If they don't, then this is the effect that we get. That's moving the red out. And if we move the blue out... Yes, colourful, but a bit weird. And when I stick them back again, wind the blue back in. And the red... Now that's what the camera should look like. Shame. I think I preferred the weird version. OK, so the colour pictures are transmitted to the TV set, but how do they get onto the screen rod? Well, your television takes the three separate colour signals, and these go to three electron guns at the back of your TV, and they then fire their own signals towards the front of the screen. It's easier to see on this model. Now, here we have the three electron guns at the back, one for the red signal, one for the green signal, and one for the blue signal, and they then fire their own signals towards the front of the screen. So what's this for here? Right, well, near the front of the tube, the signals go through a mesh. It's called a shadow mask, and it's a bit like a fine sieve. It makes sure that the signals from the guns arrive at the right dots. Now, the dots are arranged in groups of three, and the whole screen's covered in them. So on a real television screen, how many would there be about? It's about one and a half million. Goodness. If you look closely, you could actually see the dots on your screen. On some televisions, they're more of a square shape. You might see them more easily if you hold a glass of water up to the screen, because that will magnify them. We've got a special close-up camera rig, so you can see what happens when there's different colour on the screen. If the screen's all white, the red, green and blue dots should all be equally bright. Yes, they are. And here's red, green and blue. It's what you'd expect, really. What about yellow? That the blue dots went off and the red and green ones came on. And here's magenta and cyan. And if we look at the ordinary picture of the studio, instead of pure colour, you can see that the dots change in brightness as we move and the picture changes. And even when you know it's only made up of red, green and blue dots, it still looks pretty convincing. These are some of the beautiful colours you can get when you dye wools the natural way, using plants. And in fact, they make up into just beautiful clothes as well. I've come here today to meet somebody who specialises in vegetable dyes. Her name's Ray Napier. Hello, Ray. Hello. Well, these are some of the things you use for your vegetable dyes, but they don't look like vegetables to me. Uh, they're mainly trees. Because I dye year-round, I can't really use seasonal things. But some of these things are plants from the garden, aren't they? Yes, this is world, which I grow in the garden. Persian berries and fustic, which is a tropical plant, all of which give yellows. Yes. The, the rest of them are really woods. This is yew, yew, which gives oranges, Brazil wood, which gives reddy colours, uh, sanders wood and logwood. Yes, now that logwood, you wouldn't expect to get blue from that one, would you? No, not really. Those ones look interesting. What are they? These are roots. This is uh, galanga and madder, which gives an orangey colour. And this one, what do you yes. think this is? Um, I don't know. Could they be seeds of some sort? It's cochineal. It's actually a beetle. Oh. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're cochineal. It gives reds and lovely pinks. Oh, a bit like... Um... Oh, yes, that's cochineal, and this one is actually logwood. Yes, beautiful. Now, what are these used for? These are mineral salts. They're mordants. There's alum, and chrome, copper sulphate and ferrous sulphate. They help the wool to take up the colour. You'll see later what different sorts of colours you get by using different mordants. Right, so using the mordants is the very first thing you have yes. to do. So shall we go and see how you do yes. that, then? Sure. So, Ray, this is how the wool starts out, isn't it? Yes, this is white wool, about 100 grams. Yes. And what mordant are you going to put with it? This is alum. So we use about a quarter of the weight of wool, which we make into a solution. And then add to a larger quantity of water. So that the wool has freedom to move and then yes. it isn't all patchy. Right. Just right. 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 I'll put okay. that in. Right. That should be warm and wetted. Lovely. 
Now, that goes on to... Onto the stove to heat for about three quarters of an hour to an hour. Right. And when it comes off the stove, mm -hmm. it'll look... This is like the alum. Yes, that's the alum. Using other mordants, this would be... Eight. That's chrome. And that one is tin. Not much difference between them at the moment. Not at this stage, but later on when we look at the dye pots, you'll see a difference there. Right. Shall we go and have a look at the dye being prepared then? Fine. And so this is the dye we're using. Yes, that's Brazil wood. Yes. Which we put about the same quantity as weight of wool you're going to dye into the dye pot and boil it up for at least an hour. And you can see, in fact, the colour has changed quite drastically. Yes, it's quite a lot. Comes a beautiful, and rich red. Lovely, rich red liquid. Beautiful crimson colour. But you don't put the wool into this pan, do you? No, I strain it into the larger dye pot with a lot more water so that the wool has room to move around. So this is the dye bath full of Brazil wood dye. Yes, and this is the wool that we have already mordanted that we add to the dye bath. And in fact, already, you've got a bit of the colour, haven't you? Yes, but if uh, you leave it in for at least half an hour, you'll see a much better colour range. Right, so we'll leave it there to cook for about half an hour. Now, these are some that have been in overnight. Yes, they're much darker, they're beautiful. Yes. And much wider range, you see the range of colours. And that comes from the different mordants then, doesn't yes. it? Yes, you can tell from my code system of knots, so I know by the number of knots which mordant I've used. And that one is? That one's alum, tin, chrome, yes. copper sulphate, yes. ferrous sulphate. And this one's actually quite different. That one has got no mordant in it at all. Yes. But you see how uneven it's likely to come out. Yes, and so that means it won't last as long. It'll actually fade. It's more likely it. to um, lose its colour, yes. yes. So Brazil wood gives you various shades of reddish purple. Yes. But do you have any other colours? Yes, we have, uh, for instance, some onion skins here. Yes. What you saw? <coughs> that is this range of colours. An amazing range of colours there. Gold, brown. Beautiful, that is. And onion skins are one of the things you can use if you want to have a go at vegetable dyeing yourself. There are plenty of things around the house and garden you could use. Broccoli, wood, tea, beetroot, spices, or even marigolds or tomato plants. But that's the leaves and not the fruits. You can try almost anything as long as it's not a rare wild plant. You'll find that most plants will give you yellowy greens. But try avocado skins and surprisingly, you could get a pinky colour if you boil the skins for long enough. You might also be surprised at what you get from red cabbage as well. If you're having a go at home rather than in the lab, do keep the dyes and the mordants away from food. And don't use your best saucepans. Apart from wool, nylon gives results with quite a few vegetable dyes. Start with small samples first. Half the fun of vegetable dyeing is just trying things out, seeing what you can get. I can't guarantee, of course, that you'll get colours as lovely as the one that Ray dyes. But just remember, any colour except white is a success. What colours do you reckon I'm wearing? <laughs> but what about now? It's tricky, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lot easier, though, in white light. My red cap and trousers reflect red light, and my green jacket reflects green light. And because white light contains all the colours of the rainbow, or spectrum, all the clothes I'm wearing can reflect their true colours. Now, if we change back to red light, my cap's OK, but look what happens to it under the green. There. Now you see if you can work out why. And what would blue light do to the rest of the colours I'm wearing? This is my little chum, Fred. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Fred's part of a theatrical mime show. And in fact, in a theatre, you can get lots of different special effects. All you want is different coloured spotlights, interesting costumes, and a well-designed set. Now, this is the model of a set built by four theatre design students called Carl, Emma, Lorna and Nonny. So how do you go about choosing the colours for the production, then? Well, first of all, we talked to the mime company and they set us a brief, which was that they wanted warm and human colours, which is 
basically this red range here. But we tried out others to see what they'd look like. And here is a cool green and blue here with the warmer colours. But we decided on a compromise, which was this, between the two. Yeah, but aren't the colours and the lights going to change all that? It's important to think about these quite a lot because you can see that if I go like that, it washes out the reds completely and all the blues become black or purple. So you have to think about it a lot. Right, well, you've decided on the colours. How would you design the costumes? Well, we sketched some ideas of the costumes and then we chose um, some samples of material that we wanted to use. We had to choose a uh, fabric which would dye easily. We've got some here that we've the colours and uh, we ended up by dyeing white fabric a reddish colour. And what's that other fabric? Um, that's a sample of the material from the set that's actually been painted and we had to think about how they'd go together. Well, as you can see in the model, the main part of the set is that silk tent which has been painted different colours in order to pick up the different lights and create different moods in that way. And why did you choose black for the floor cloth? Well, the real colour of the theatre floor is a very strong wooden colour. Just kill off all the warm colours in the costume and the tent. Of course, no show would be complete without its performers. And here's baby Fred again, <laughs> being held by Mother Martina. Hello. Now, they're being bathed in a warm pink light, and that gives a sort of mm, caring, motherly sort of feeling. Much more than you get from this character, who's Fred when he's grown up a bit. All right, Fred, settle down. Fred here is being worked by this lady behind, who is Anya, look, see, a real person. But she wears all this black gear because in theatre there's a convention, anything black is invisible. And to all intents and purposes, Anya in this costume against the black background is invisible. The rest of the cast are wearing warm colours. But have a look at how those colours change with the lights in the party scene. Come on! Oh, 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 come on! Come on! Come on! Everything should combine to make a final effect. A certain mood needs to be created for each scene, so everything works together, the lights, the costume, the sets, and also the music, which um, I wrote especially for the show. The colour wheel works really well because the light reflected on the tent really adds to the movement, and so it becomes very, very fluid. The white of the tent is quite like a blank canvas that we can paint any colour of light on it and give a different effect. in black and white, isn't it? <laughs> it's amazing what a difference. The colours we wear and the colours all around us can sometimes even affect our mood. This studio is quite bright, lots of splashes of yellow, plenty of other colours as well, but you wouldn't be able to see any colours at all without light. 
We see most things by white light, mainly sunlight. It's actually more the colours of the rainbow. But because of the way our eyes work, we can make white light using just this. Colour can make... Yes, whether it's artificial colours like these, or whether it's natural colours, they all brighten things up a bit. Some colours look quite appetising. But would you want to eat this? We pick up a lot of information from colour as well. It can warn us or control traffic or help safety by, by making us stand out in a crowd. colours. Red. Green. Blue. These are the three primary colours of light and by mixing them together in different amounts you can get any colour you like. Now if you mix together equal amounts of two of them you get what's called the secondary colours. For instance here where you're mixing